Hello, everybody at home. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our weekly poetry series. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined today by poets Marilyn Callett and Maria James Chow. Uh, Marilyn was one of my teachers at UTK and on my thesis committee, so it's really good to see her again. Um, and the way the formatting is going to work today, each poet is going to read for 15 minutes, followed by a discussion on craft. And viewers, feel free to make comments or ask questions throughout, and we'll respond to them at the end of the readings. Maria is going to read first. Her video is a little jumpy, but uh, we should be able to hear her fine. So just bear with us. Um, so Maria, I'll introduce you. Uh, Maria James Chow is an award-winning poet, performer, playwright, and professor. She has poetry and reviews published in New Letters, Cutthroat Journal of the Arts, One Trick Pony Review, and Black Magnolias, as well as a spoken word CD entitled Free Verse, many anthologies in the collections Windows to the Soul, Rising Waters, Talking White, and her choreo program, sorry, choreo poem, Reclaiming My Time, an American Riot Project, which sold out six times in March 2018. With Janet Bixler, the director of Reclaiming My Time, Maria has begun a soon-to-be nonprofit organization called Reclaim Artist Collective that will provide marginalized communities, emerging artists, and schools with affordable theater and literary arts programming, wellness retreats, and creative workshops. All right, Maria, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, of course, that bio was written in the before, so let's see what affordable arts programs means um, soon, but <laughs> we're keeping it positive. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. The first poem I'm going to share with you uh, is from Reclaiming My Time, which, as you said, is a choreo poem, and for those that aren't familiar, uh, choreo poems are uh, a play written in poetic form. And um, Reclaiming My Time was based on stories from women between the ages of 60 and 95 about their memories of the civil rights era. So this one is from uh, a woman named Georgia Johnson from Washington, D.C., not the Harlem Renaissance poet, but a great lady, about an experience she had when she was uh, a kid on a bus in the 1940s. Our parents were like shields against the heat of racism in our town. Our black street was a dark iris, the life-giving pollen-filled center of a white flower. Our folks were respected professionals, educators, scholars. We were allowed in spaces our colored classmates couldn't go. So I hadn't formally met old Jim Crow. Until that day, my friend and I tried to board a bus home. With a sweet smile, I approached a white woman sitting alone and said, pardon me, ma'am, but your packages have claimed the last available seats. I sure would like to rest these tired feet. Would you mind? Would you mind? Maybe her ears are weak. Pardon me, ma'am. Your packages have claimed the last available seat. I sure would like to rest these tired feet. Would you mind? Would you mind? Ma'am, a minor move, a slight adjustment, a little room, would you mind? Would you mind? Ma'am, I think your ears are fine. I know you hear me, your steely blue staring me in my face. All I asked for was a little space. Would you mind? Would you mind? Would you mind moving your packages so I can have a seat, rest my feet, sit for a bit? Would you mind? Her eyes narrowed, as did mine. It was about to get good, bad, and ugly in here. <laughs> my, I slung those bags to the floor so fast, so fast. The driver slammed on the brakes. She clutched her pearls in shock, and my friend's voice echoed like a drumbeat in my ears. Go, Georgie, go. Go, Georgie, go. Go, Georgie, go. Adrenaline carried us home on worn out, handed down old school shoes. My friend said I could have gotten us locked up or worse. Said I shouldn't have sassed that lady. Said that's just the way it is. But she was wrong. She was wrong. 
That was my introduction. That was how I met old Jim Crow. And that was Would You Mind by, by me, but from Reclaiming My Time. So it's such a pleasure to be here with um, Marilyn, who's my, my mentor and teacher, taught me so much. And we'll talk more about this later, but I went to France and studied poetry with her and it was twice and it was life changing. And of course, Facebook memories are reminding me of every day I spent in Ovalar um, by sending me the pictures again. And so I had to pull out one of my poems from that experience in France. This is La Fleur. It's not that he was attractive with his time-worn face and clay European mop of curly hair. There was no cowboy in him, no Armani-laden capitalist or Clooney-esque quality. He wasn't pretty, nor could Pex be seen under his too respectable brown tweed jacket. And yet, in that moment, he had lassoed the imagination of every woman in the outdoor cafe. It was the way he leaned back in his plastic chair without questioning its strength to hold him. The, he closed his eyes, planted his face in a thriving blossom, drew in air from his core and took it all in. One deep breath inward, swirling his head so the petals could caress his face. He wanted to wear this scent as if it were the first scent he'd ever smelled or the last he ever would, as if the scent itself stopped time. He wrapped it around his head like a turban, let it dance in his nostrils, lapping it up. He was a kitten in milk. We could see his mind caressing it like something fleshy and soft. He let it envelop him until the plant itself moaned and quaked in ecstasy. And I, with a cold blocking my nose, was merely an envious voyeur. But my friend arose herself, tired of the feeling of being stopped up by life's tragedies and demands, marched over to that plant without hesitation, her words swirling in the dust her feet had left behind. I'll have what he's having, she demanded. Je ce qu'il a. La fleur. And that's, that's in my uh, 2013 book, Talking White, with a lot of poems from Ovalar. But lately, what we're going through as a nation has really opened the floodgates. At first, I couldn't write at all. And then one day, boom, um, I started writing a lot. So I have a couple more poems to share with you about what we're going through now. The, this one is called The Open Gate. And it was written when I realized that it had only been a couple weeks after studies showed that black and brown people and those in urban areas are more likely to die of COVID-19. And then at that time, Georgia decided to reopen for business. Um, the open gate starts with a quote from Edgar Allan Poe. And anon there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet and then for a moment, all is still and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. Mask of the Red Death. The ebony clock tick tocks to the rhythm of my great grandfather's feet as he still saunters high headed down Spring Hill Road in Georgia. Only the gifted can see him now when he slips into the rhythm of his past life and winks at honeytone ladies leaving church, imagining the red heat rising in their cheeks, the twinkle in their mahogany eyes, or 
when the night rolls in and he lurks in trenches along the road's edge, armed, ready, imagining his neighbors beside him waiting for the clan to ride by. His memories replay as dead memories do when specters hang around long after that ebony clock has chimed, that time halting musical signal of the end. Now the clock tick tocks to and fro to the rhythm of his feet and he peers deep into the light he's been avoiding. He sees folk getting ready. He sees folk making room. A revelry in the heavens, iron gates unchained. They're about to open up. Ain't been preparations like this since the world was at war, he thinks. An influx is coming. My great granddaddy waits in the trench he dug decades ago, showing the ebony clock's tick tock will stop its dull, heavy, monotonous clang and release a chime from its brazen lungs. All will be still then as a parade of Georgians march toward glory. If he sees one of his kin on their way to the light, he'll take their hand and tell them, I didn't mean to leave the red clay. Couldn't stand to say goodbye, just mumbled a lie and jumped the train, taking my last look at Georgia. The clan done run me out for shooting them off they horses. I ain't know there was police and politicians under them robes, men with the power to break up families. Hateful, heartless, treating black lives like trash. He would take their hand, make them understand I had to go north, had to shelter in place to protect y'all from the plague of hate back home. He quarantined in Detroit, planning to return when things had changed, when the demons were unmasked and the pathogen of racism stopped spreading in the land of his birth. But he died of pneumonia in the palm of a neglectful healthcare system. He returned home as a specter waiting for his shame to let him cross over. But how can my great grands understand my world, he thought. A world where Negro lives meant nothing. Where health care was unequal. Where politicians lie to protect profits over people. They can't forgive me, he figured. They couldn't understand. The ebony clock tick-tocks to and fro to the rhythm of my great-grandfather's feet as he walks away from the light once again, head hung low. He hunkers down, stiff frozen as a dream deferred in the trench he dug decades past alongside Spring Hill Road in Thomasville, Georgia. Yes, that is where my... My ancestry comes from Thomasville. And it has been a long time since I've been there. But if you watch a lot of news and do ancestry to relax, that's the kind of poems that happen. <laughs> so my very last poem is about pandemic as well. It's called Spit Spreads Death. Her eyes scream. The cross on her cap points toward heaven, the cross on her apron close to her heart. Dark bangs drop over brow as if from exhaustion, tight cloth mask, nose and mouth. It's caution tape, a barrier between her and horror, though all the while her eyes scream. Piercing gray under heavy lids, red tentacles reaching out like claws, or, or did I imagine those? There's something red about her sepia expression, red and imposing in the colorless photo. Her eyes scream. They've seen death, seen it coming in a wave through reservations, rural towns, workhouses, seen it devour the poor, dig mass graves, take whole families in a matter of hours. Death has yet to touch her, but it's come close. She's felt its hot sulfur breath on her neck. It came here with the parade. Politicians planned to fund their war. When science and politi politics mix, politics win. 
And this city where the Constitution was signed was too proud, too American to shelter in place. Her eyes screamed. When she saw them gathered there, shoulder to shoulder, ungloved hands, waving flags, unmasked cheers, flying from mouths, instruments, spitting out anthems. They hadn't listened. They hadn't seen it, hadn't felt it so for breath, but they would. In a few days, they would. She prepared beds for them. Inside stretched hospital walls, hotels, parishes, colleges. Death came for them with arms wide, with reinforcements to flatten the morgue with bodies. 12,000 souls. Her eyes scream above the cloth, tight enough to block death from her mouth or so she hopes. The striking black caption, visible on walls, trolley cars, lampposts, says it all. Spit spreads death. She knows it so. Her eyes scream. Thank you. That was very good, thank you. Oh, and gave me the shivers. Yeah, <laughs> actually. But, um, Marilyn's going to read next, so I'll introduce her. Marilyn Callett is serving her second term as Knoxville Poet Laureate. She has published 18 books, including How Our Bodies Learned, The Love That Moves Me, and Packing Light, New and Selected Poems. She has translated Paul Eluard's Last Love Poems and Benjamin Perret's The Big Game. Dr. Callett is Professor Emerita at the University of Tennessee. She mentor mentors poetry groups for the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts in Avalar, France. Her poetry has appeared recently in New Letters, Plume, One, and North American Review. Poetry is forthcoming in Cutthroat, 101 Jewish po Poems for the New Millennium, and New Voices, an anthology of contemporary voices confronting anti-Semitism. All right, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I want to say thanks mm -hmm. to Nicole Yackley for inviting us to do this show. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Read It Again Books for, for opening this program for us. And thanks to my friend Maria James Theo for reading with me. Isn't she wonderful? Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. I told you. Um, yeah, every spring for the last 11 years, I've done, a, I've led a poetry residency or writing workshop for the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts in Ovilar, Southwest France. And, um, oh, what a gig. I mean, the food, the wine, the people, and then, of course, yeah, we write some poems. I mean, I don't know when, but we do, um, as Maria has clearly shown you. Of course, this spring, there will be no travel to Ovilar. So like Maria, I think I'd like to start off with a couple of Ovilar poems and then move into some of the comfort songs that I've been writing over the pandemic. The first one is called, I Want You Here. And it's the opening poem from um, The Love That Moves Me, which came out in 2013. I want you here. I want you here so badly, my fingertips ache. Roses droop against the thorns. The green light of the Garonne stuns my eyes. I talk to dogs, to my chair, listen at the neighbor's door. The old stones of the village are too smooth. The stubble of your chin would do. I want you here so badly, I can taste your salt. I'll save a place or two for your mouth, listen hard for your tongue. We'll coo like mad doves, become ballads, legends, climb to the Centreville, devour the first May cherries, pilgrims at home in each other beneath the blue sheet of sky. The first time I read that, I read that at the auditorium at UT. My husband was in the front row and he said, who's that for? And I said, you. This one is called Encore, and it's based on a poem by El that riffs off of a poem by Paul Eluard. Encore, I love you for all the men I do not love and for those I adore, for the crackle of croissant and the perfume of escargot, for macho, macho man at Café Saint-Victor and the snobs at Libéré Compagnie, for les chats français, le chat américain, for all the Frenchmen whose beauty wrapped in olive oil, olive oil cannot equal the taste of yours. I love you to love. 
I love you for your silences, but I prefer your songs. I love you for your wisdom, which is mostly in your arms. Tell me who you haunt, and I'll tell you who you are. You haunt me like a summer hit. Replay me on your lips. I love you for all the wine I have not tasted. I love you to stay drunk on love, like Baudelaire and Arthur, but breathing. So I started writing a comfort song every day. I heard Yo-Yo Ma on PBS and he said he, he was doing comfort songs and he suggested that we all try that. So I started to do that right away and so it, it calmed me down. Comfort song in a time of peril. Sleep, little one. Mama has washed her hands. Daddy won't touch his face again. We'll keep you from harm with love and antibacterial wipes. We'll scrub everything twice. Mommy will keep daddy happy with her tongue. Ah, uh, wait, that's a different poem. Mommy will sing you a powerful germ-free lullaby. Sleep, little one. The president is an idiot, but you will grow up to be smart, empowered, fearless. And by then there will be a vaccine and a Democrat. This is called Spiritual, and it opens with a line by William Carlos Williams. What power has love? Spiritual, what power has love during a pandemic? Ours was always virtual. Plato had it right. Kind love swells stronger like a muscle that has been working out, but lighter, invisible, like atomic weights. Love that lifts us daily without hope of gain. We practiced for this. Virtual, virtuous, faute de mieux. Write to me, buddy. Plato, Plato. Mixed metaphors taste good. Honey, words are all we have and hold. So lately, we've been watching the birds more, and um, you know, because that's that's what there is, and they're they're wonderful. There's one big blue jay that's not afraid of, of me or the other birds. This is called the biggest blue jay. The biggest blue jay lives in the hedge next door. I have hedge envy. He swoops in once daily when I set out no crumbs, four times per if I drop seeds or multigrain bits. Passover begins tomorrow, so we'll see if whole wheat matzo warrants his bright blue flight. I am in love with a bird whom Lou does not envy. He's a secure guy. When I confess that I write to a poet once a week, that Air Force dude, Lou didn't blink. 39 years and he's serene about love. He, the only thing we argue in our suburban fort is how to fold the hand towels. Also, whether to watch All Rise or A French Village. I gave him that rerun. I'll name the J Bo. Oh, les bourgeois de bonheur indicible. Oh, the fine days of unspeakable joy. Alas, Verlaine, these unspeakable days are not carefree. Tell Rambo we're done. I'm thankful to be cooped up with a good man, grateful that the blues have wings. Then I guess we, Lou and I have been bickering about, you know, small things. I, I'm guessing that other people have, have had this, uh, have had this, experience as well. So this is called Apology to Lou, as he's the main character, he and the bluebird. Apology to Lou. Sorry for yelling when I spilled the coffee. Sorry for stains on the rug that resemble squalling babies. Sorry for the gray rain that nails us. Sorry for not trusting that you would heed my cry. Sorry we rewatched a half hour of the marriage. Adam Driver is dynamite, though. Ferris Bueller offered the cure. Sorry made of coffee grounds and mean rain. Sorry made of wet grass and heat rash. Sorry made of I'll leave you the last brownie and Ritter sport dark chocolate that will arrive in some day's mail. Sorry made of cheap toilet paper with no holes for the holder. Sorry made of birdsong. Thank the Carolina wren who pecks our smallest seeds. Thank the blue jay who does not wait in line for ancient grains. Sorry made of blossoms and better days. 
This one's called Blackberry Winter. Um, when the spring was early May, when it was really cold, they call that Blackberry Winter. I think it's because it's bl uh, blackberry season. Blackberry Winter, bird watching winter, cardinal, blue jay, toey winter, lou on hand, winter with a drop of desire. Stir fry winter, stir crazy winter, May winter, iris winter, springy winter, no more King Lear winter, come spring, Bathe those magnolias in warmer light. Tweets and leaves. Guys, there's seed in the feeder. Squirrel, I'll just perch underneath in the upright prayer pose. Breeze, I'll tremble leaves and spill millet. Lou, good news. My sister advocated for my locked up mom. Now she's allowed to leave the facility to walk outdoors in the sun. Light, tell the air to be particle free, kind. Blue jays imitate hawks. No one's fooled. Yes, we look up. We pray, study, and work for a real leader, for a do-no-more-harmer come November. And uh, Lou came in the other day. He was so excited he found this. The red the red-shouldered hawk is out there. Hi, Todd. And uh, so we have this beautiful quill that might have been used as a pen in an earlier time. Taking dictation from the hawk. I found today's object, Lou cheered, waved a hawk's feather, the kind an English gentleman might have dipped in ink back when. White and brown, the stripes wave like painted water, earth and sky rippling. Two smiles and an eye etched the quill. The eye slit seems wary like that of a snake or a fairy tale villain. At the kitchen table, when I hone in, my mother blinks the oven light. Jealous of a feather? Keep it light, the feather warns. Remember that high-priced Jungian in San Diego? June Singer. She fell asleep during your session. When you called her out, she sighed, you were talking about your mother again. Not even 300 bucks could keep her awake. The red-shouldered hawk had a mother, too. So agile she birthed plumes that swooped and soared. Keep it light, or the hawk might charge you by the hour. Write love songs and silly lines about Herbie the Roach and Marvin the Possum, not the ballad of your mama, mama blinking green eyes at your private first-class dad, not his rage and fear, no bankruptcy, not the Joey Gallo story, just two smiles, whispery, write a feather tickling. Help the poem forget. A couplet should not require an attorney. Not every poem calls for last will, breath, and testament. Well, Lou was roaming around the yard. He found some morels, a very fancy mushroom that I had never tasted before. And they were absolutely <laughs> all about the birds and Lou. Yes, Toby. <laughs> the morels are, um, Lou fried them up. They were amazing. So this is about the morels. They were a neighborhood family of mushrooms living right down by the side of the house. I would have trampled them, but my ecologist spouse tenderly brought them in, cleaned, then fried them in butter and Sauvignon fumé. A heady smell arose. Woodsy flavors emerged from the pan. Those knobby ones urged me to taste more. Sure, we're cloistered, closed in, but the morels made me see that fried wasn't wrong. I mean, look at them poking up out of the ground like that. So even just walking out the door of the house, you know, walking outside for a minute, there's a poem waiting, whispering. At first, I guessed you were a petal in the breeze, but it was mid-May, too late for dogwoods. You floated fast and light, satin moth. How I envy your whisper over ground. Someday I will be lighter o'er the earth, ancient grammar in the wind, as they say. And I'm going to wrap with uh, wrap this up with with an older poem, which is "Love Song for the Ageless." If we were ageless and wore no bodies, we could rendezvous on a slip of light on a firefly's back, and and no one would begrudge us, and and my face wouldn't crack. No more death mask jokes, no punchline blows. Who crumbles from them? Not us and Mandy, it's not any object, present or past. Me, my pretensions, who did I think I was? I'll be out of time soon enough. 
stick to that, that time of year bear. If we were ageless, bodiless, we'd meet like this in words, pinpricks of light, this other real, almost flesh. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing as always. Um, so now we're going to move into a, a discussion portion of the evening where we can talk about craft and answer any audience questions and things like that. Um, I believe you guys were both very interested in the performance of poetry. Do you want to talk a little about that? Yeah, sure. That's, that's certainly one thing we have in common. Maria, you want to go first? Well, first, for, um, oh, microphone. There you go. There you go. <laughs> First, I wanted to say when I he just hearing your voice and uh, talking about Lou and Lou cooking anything um, makes me want wine. I, I don't know why it's just <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> um, but that that was a beautiful reading as Thank always. Um, what first when it comes to performance? What first? Were you all, were you naturally a performer or did you uh, learn that along the way? I thought I was a performer. I thought, you know, I was always expressive. I was, you know, when I was reading my poems, I was looking out to the audience and, and our, our mutual friend, Callie Meister was one of my students and she's a theater person. She's a great actress and director. And so when the course was over, I said, I asked her, would you be willing to tutor me for a few sessions? We met upstairs at the candy factory in a sort of a, a, a theater setting and uh, once a week and she would, she would mentor me. And the first thing I had, I was, I was going like this, you know, and, and she was like, what are you doing? If Are you, do, are you rousing the populace? Put your hands down. Like, Oops. So that was the first moment of awakening. You know, let, let the words have some power. Let the words carry the work rather than the, you know, sort of like that. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while, I still find myself doing it. No, because I have to go, no, I'm not rousing the populace. I'm just reading a poem. It's fine. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so she taught me. I mean, that was the beginning of a, a whole, uh, you know, new, a wake up for me. Mm -hmm. um, and and rehearsing, practicing the po doing the poems as opposed to uh, just reading them off the page. What about you, Maria? What is performance meant for you? Well, I started sharing my poetry in the mid nineties when spoken word was very, um, very hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I, it's still hot, but in a different way. Yes. And um, so sh the more you share the, and the more you get in those spaces with many poets and the more you listen and and the more you read the more you just you pick up things but i i would say some of it though also came from uh the dramatic because i was in plays in high school and i remember little rules here and there little um bits of advice along the way like starting starting off strong so that they your first word really gets people's attention and wakes them up and um, playing with uh, alliteration and sound and things like that. Um, just some advice along the way as uh, I went through different plays and things. And that flowed into my spoken word life in the poetry slams. And then as my poems grew to be more vivid and less reliant on, um, on rhyme and things like that, then it just, I don't know, I think the performance illustrates what the words are saying rather than the p performance being stronger than the words. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. You know, you're bringing up the 90s and performance poetry. That was also um, a wake up for me. I mean, my uh, some of my students were really good uh, performance poets and they did slam poetry. So I went to the slams, I would do the open mic and sometimes I would slam. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, my, my students taught me a lot because they were out there. I mean, they had the poems by heart and they were embodying them. And it was like, and then they were looking at me like, why are you reading off a page? You don't <laughs> yeah. have to do that. 
Um, and I remember the first time I slammed, I came home and I got, I, it was, you know, you get a 10 points in the slam possible, right? And mm -hmm. one of my students, one of the current undergraduates at that point was a judge. He gave me a two, <gasps> two out of 10. Mark Cherry, his name was. And he was in my class. I was going to give him a, a grade. And he gave me a two. Anyway, it, try, it made me want to try harder, OK? <laughs> yeah. you, the only way to do it better is to practice. You know, and to watch yeah. people who do it better. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think it's important uh, to to go to poetry readings. Now, even when we're in this state of dystopia, um, we can find poetry readings like this online. And mm -hmm. I know in my community, uh, the regular readings they're they're um, meeting on Zoom every week now. And so that helps keep the creative juices flowing and, and, and you can always learn and grow from the readings, watching and listening. Mm -hmm. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if you're open to it. <laughs> well, my husband is such a critic, you know, he would go with me to the poet, some of the poetry readings at UT and he would like, I just want to rip the book out of his hand and show him how to read that like Lou. <laughs> don't do that don't do that sweetheart <laughs> and he'll show me sometimes like oh, do you want you yeah, do you want to hear that how that how i would read that okay yeah let's hear it there's toby like all about birds and loo <laughs> yeah. Yeah. anyway i married my critic <laughs> my my husband just pretends he understands what i'm saying and he usually doesn't <laughs> That's okay. I like that about him that he pretends he does. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> um, my, I, another question I, I had for you is now I know that you've been through some incredible parts of history. Um, I remember the, the terrorist attack in Paris. And then what we're going through now, I mean, th these things are so heavy. And how has how has it affected you as a poet? How has your poetry helped you through those things? That's, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, and I, w I was in New York, I was in lower Manhattan on 9-11. So um, I have friends who w for a long time wouldn't travel with me. You know, because mm -hmm. New York at 9-11 and then Paris during the terror attacks. <laughs> but um, the uh, New York, I, I started making little notes about what happened there as soon as it was happening. I mean, I, I, I think what happens is that when we're used to writing, and especially if we're used to writing every day, mm -hmm. When we're when we bear witness to something, and we know we know that we are we don't know quite yet the extent of it. You know, when when the planes hit the tower the first time, we didn't know, and then and then it gradually became clear what was going on. Um, we are called upon to bear witness, and uh, we become like reporters. We're closer to reporters in those historical moments than we are, uh, you know, for writing about the, you know, the our love poems or the imagining what you know, what the, what a fantasy world is like. Sometimes we have to become like reporters and doing, doing the daily exercise of writing that really bears fruit when you're, when something really serious happens, like it is now. Mm. Yeah. That, that reminds me of a quote from James Baldwin, but I don't remember the exact quote, so I won't butcher it, but <laughs> I remember him saying something to that effect when he had to, um, that he had to write he he did he was around his friends Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, but he Edgar uh, Megger Evers, but he wasn't to be the leader in the movement. He was the one to document it. Mm -hmm. That um, it is important for us to to document these moments. Yeah, that's what we're doing. And then, of course, on a personal level, it calms us down to write because there is that. There's that place where you are actually in control. You can organize and order your feelings and your the sounds of words. And so having that little bit of control is very therapeutic. And having a place to express our feelings 
without anybody being alarmed or uh, hurt by it, that's there. It's therapeutic also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It looks like Kim posted maybe the James Baldwin quote uh, in the comments. Uh, so I think it might be the world changes, uh, sorry, according to the way people see it. And if you alter even but a millimeter, the way people change, the way people look at reality, then you can change it. And you write in order to change the world, knowing perfectly well that you probably can't, but also knowing that literature is indispensable to the world. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter even but a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Mm. So is that the quote you were thinking of? Yes, yeah. yes, very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very powerful. What would you guys say is the difference between documenting things in poetry and documenting it with like the news and fact? What does poetry give? give? We, we bring our, our personal uh, feelings to it. A reporter is gonna try to be objective, somewhat objective, and we're not trying to be objective. We're expressing expressing our, our relation to that object or that event as it goes on. Sorry about that. The uh, similarity with, with the reporter is that we want to get it right. We want to document things accurately. We want to say what we're seeing and you know, get that address right where where Adele Kurzweil lived before the Holocaust. Uh, you know, it because it matters. It's gonna to matter to people who are engaged, involved in that moment of history. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're also bringing our feelings to it and, uh, and not being shy about that. And in fact, exploring our feelings. And we're singing. We're, we're, we're looking at how language occurs rhythmically, which I think the reporters are trying to be clear and crisp in their language, but not, it's not about rhythm so much. What do you think, Maria? And, and even if reporters are talking about something that's very emotional, they make it very they, they do their best not to get emotional mm -hmm. when delivering that. Um, and like I see sometimes the local news trying to talk about um, like maybe Trump's briefings or something. And the president says this and they don't crack, you know, <laughs> you want to bang your head on a wall, don't you? But they don't. <laughs> and it's the poet who can say exactly what happened there, but, <laughs> um, you know, and all the feelings behind it. Um, I find myself making a bridge of connection from what happened in the past to what's happening now, um, because mm -hmm. that's my way of helping people get an understanding of what's happening, yeah, that's <laughs> going on. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel a kinship with the local reporters here in town. Um, they've been really good to poetry. Um, and so, you know, they will, they'll call, call on me if something's happening or they'll have me read this, you know, read a poem on the air. So um, they're sort of welcoming me into their living room. Like I, and I literally want, want a couple of them have come over to the house to ask me questions about poetry. Why? I mean, with everything that's going on, right? But. <laughs> So I love it. I mean, they, they feel that, that bit of kinship too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, yeah. And I think that's one thing poetry does, mm -hmm. sorry, is it like creates the connections between people and in a way that the news really doesn't, it like draws people together more. I hope so. We hope so. We try and it makes us less fun. Well, mm -hmm. I think we can get our message across to people uh, as poets easier than, um, news where people will shut out different opinions and ideas. They, they may be more open to hearing it from a poet <laughs> coming from it's, it's, it's artful and it, it may be beautifully said. And so I think they're a little more open to us than they might be to the, the other news network. Unless they're scared <laughs> of poetry. I mean, some people were taught poetry badly in middle school. So when yes. you say you're a poet, they're like, oh, no, you know, poetry, I was never, no. So <laughs> the poetry is like the barometer of stupidity. And the teacher was always going, okay, everybody else hears the I am, so why can't you hear them? <laughs> so there are some people that are like, you know, back off poetry, you know. But right, right. when they realize that you're using language that everybody uses, maybe maybe a little more concisely, mm -hmm. um, maybe they're not, they're, they don't have to be afraid because they'll understand it. 
you know, we're writing poems that people can understand. True, true. Well, I tend to think of poetry as like a as a medium. And you can't write off an entire medium, you know? Like you can't say, oh, I like drawings, but I don't like sculptures. You know? <laughs> There's some part of poetry that you will probably like. I hope so, yeah. You just might not have found it yet. I hadn't thought of it that way. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> the poets are the truth tellers. If if what we did wasn't important, there wouldn't be so many of us in jail all around the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, it's not funny. It's it's uh -huh. true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. There's there are so many. I had one poem where I used to read off the list of, of their names, and that just got very long and very sad. Um, how many people have because of a poem they wrote are incarcerated or otherwise mm -hmm. in trouble or missing? Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's important. Poems of Witness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm looking to see that um, one of our, you know, one of our good friends, Joy Harjo, who was here at UT for three years as uh, the um, uh, creative writing chair of, uh, chair of excellence, is now the U.S. Poet Laureate. And um, her poems are always always so meaningful and unifying. And uh, so I, I, if, you do, if you haven't read her, her book, An American Sunrise, yet I would get that. Um, Nicole, I'm sure the store has it, yes? We do, yes. Good. Okay, Absolutely. good. Absolutely, and we can post links in the comments for that in, in a good. minute. Good, yay. Yeah, She's of wonderful. course we have American Sunrise. Of course you do, <laughs> I wouldn't insult you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, what I, other poetry collections would the two of you recommend? Well, we had talked earlier about Ocean Wong's book, um, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, which is uh, mm -hmm. you know, a younger poet who's absolutely sublime, uh, Vietnamese um, in, uh, uh, in, in his background. I would definitely recommend that. Um, poems, Charlotte Pence has a new book out called Code. Apparently she's coming to, your, to the store she soon. Is. Uh, in July, July third, I believe she'll be on our on our talk. Um, our, Tiana Clark, Ada Limon, Kate Daniels, um, Pui Ying Wang, and uh, Tim Swermont, All of those. Lucy Anderton is wonderful. She's over in Ovilar. Um, mm -hmm. So th those are just a few. What? What? Who are you looking? Who are you reading now, Maria? Um, I. I'm a big Ross Gay fan. Absolutely. Yes. He is Let's wonderful. put him on the list. <laughs> yes, put him on the list. Yes, please. I just read, um, and I forget the name of the book, but the poet is Jericho Brown. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, was it The Tradition? Was that it? Yes, yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> right, yeah, it just won, just won the Pulitzer Prize. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mm -hmm. just got an online version and it, it is really nice. Um, and um, what, who else? We had talked earlier about Kevin Young. You, uh, uh, Nicole, mm -hmm. Kevin Young. Kevin Young. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tressaway is another favorite. Mm -hmm. And she was the, the Georgia, um, or she was the poet laureate. Yeah, but I from, from so. yes, yeah, she's she's at Emory, or she mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I love her work, and I love how she, again, documents a moment with poetry by going. Uh, the one book, she uh, had photographs of Octoroon women in New Orleans, right. and and wrote right. photographs. Yeah. I that I thought that mm -hmm. was brilliant. You know, oh, speaking, and, sorry. Mm -hmm. I just another people keep popping in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jackie, um, Jackie Green. I think she has a hyphenated name like me, and I'm forgetting it. But she's a poet laureate of North Carolina, and um, I just discovered her work. I feel like it's really nice. I loved how the American um, Academy of Poets they did shelter in poetry. And so um, I just I just love that, and I just started 
listening to people and then reading more of their work from that. Very, very good. Uh, another Georgia poet is Alice Fryman, who's absolutely superb. Everything she's written, um, she's amazing. She's got several books out. The View from Saturn is one of them. Um, the Rotten Daughter is another one. Uh, she's mm. just she's amazing. So Alice Fryman is a truth teller. And Karen Head is at Georgia Tech. She's very good too. Mm. Yeah. And you had mentioned Tiana Clark. She was on uh, a few weeks ago too. So yeah. if people want to watch the video with her, they, they can find that she's on our good, page. She's uh, a really good reader. She's a really, really uh, a nice yeah. person. And I, that probably shouldn't matter, you know, but it does. <laughs> like that ties into performance. You know, yeah, if you're a nice so. person in the performance of the poetry, you can you can kind of tell that. We hope so. It really does. It really does. Being nice <laughs> matters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a highly technical advice, you know. <laughs> but being nice. Okay, let's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the I, just, I oh, I just uh, in March before the world turned upside down, at yeah. least for us in America, um, <laughs> I met uh, and got a wonderful autographed copy of her latest book, Nikki Giovanni. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. from Knoxville, right? <laughs> and Nikki Finney is also a wonderful poet and really, yeah. really kind and friendly. And you know, she's somebody you should have in Nikki yes, Finney. Definitely. Seriously. Um, I'll have to send out a lot more emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, how much time do you have? <laughs> well, it depends on how long the pandemic lasts, kind of, is how long our <laughs> online program will go, I imagine. <laughs> well, hopefully, it'll go on and on because we, as we're talking, you know, we keep thinking of good people and mm -hmm. so many more that, you know, once we hang up the, the you know, the on this, we're going to start thinking of like a hundred more, like, you know, I. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. And I know, I know Marilyn was saying that she's not really reading much poetry right now, but reading more mystery novels. Is what are you reaching for for comfort right now, Maria? Are you doing reading poetry or something else? Well, I um, I'm preparing. I just started a new position. Um, I'm in charge of the creative writing program at. Uh, Capital Area School for the Arts in Harrisburg. Fantastic. So it's it's, awesome. it's like fame. I'm so excited. And <laughs> I really, I only worked there two weeks before uh, the shutdown. So, but it was two weeks of getting to know some wonderful writers. That's great. And so yes, what, one thing that calms me down is preparing for next year just to know that there will be a time when I can leave my house and be back with my young scholars again. <laughs> so um, I was reading a, a teaching creative writing book. I was reading uh, Fahrenheit 451 again, because I love it. Um, um, but, and another one that's just, just fun for me is uh, Kindred by Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that. It has everything I love. It has history. It has time travel, um, love. It has it has it all. So I'm really, I really love that. And then I also, I also love to color. I love adult coloring books. And that helps me calm down too. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, before this misery started, I did, uh, I did a bunch of gigs at the East Tennessee Freedom School in, in Knoxville. Oh. Is that there? And um, this is, these are schools uh, that focus on training African-American pupils of all ages. So I worked with the little people and I worked with the nine to 11 year olds. And when I was working with the nine to 11 year olds, um, one of the boys, Brian, he was nine, he said to me, can I be your manager? Oh. And I said, of course you can be my manager. That would be wonderful. What are you gonna do for me? And he said, I'll let you know when you go on too long or when you get boring. I was like, great, great. I said, how are you going to let me know that? He said, I'll give you a signal. I said, well, what's the signal going to be? Don't go like this. We don't do that. Uh, he went, I'll just go like this. Great. He did that three times during my talk. <laughs> Thank goodness for, for young helpers, right? Yes. <laughs> 
Well, we can't see our audience today, so there's no one to let us know. <laughs> Oh. But I see some, right. some comments people have said, which is very nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice feature. That is. Mm -hmm. so when we first started, I was I was a little nervous because I'm not playing. I don't have people to play off of or stare at or right. <laughs> smile at. Yeah. <laughs> so it's There's right. no audience to draw energy from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's new. You just kind of have, have to trust the air. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not looking at a pile of laundry over there or anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the blue cow in back of me, but you can't see the way the bookcase is sinking. Uh, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> can't quite mm -hmm. see Rage Against the Machine, which is back there. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? Allison Davis says we love it, and she's going to be on uh, in I think two weeks. She's so good. She's just you Allison know, creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. Yes, I vote mm -hmm. yes on mm -hmm. Allison mm -hmm. Davis. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. best a young manager, right? <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, and we uh, we sell adult coloring books at our store. So if anybody needs that as a uh, Marie recommended way to relax. Uh, we have those. And uh, if you want time travel and things like that, we have a sci-fi book club that meets every month uh, oh, over cool. over Google Meet now. <laughs> uh, so and so what was, the, the what was that book you were recommending to me that was done in letters? Yeah, the one we just had our, our book club yesterday for sci-fi and we read a time travel book called um, this is how you lose the time war by Amal Al Motar yeah. and Max Gladstone, and she's actually a poet as well. Um, and so this book is very—it's very poetic, and um, it's told—it's a love story between two um, warriors on either side of a time war uh, who write letters to each other. So it's that sounds good. a epistolary time travel poetic novel. <laughs> and so, do you mail do you mail books to people? I mean, are you doing online? We stuff? can. Yep. Yeah, uh, so we can mail things to you. Um, we're also doing curbside. Um, so if you, you can text us or email us or call in uh, to place orders and uh, we can either just have them ready for you to pick up or mail them to you if you're not Perfect. nearby or leaving your house. Thank yeah. you. Do you have fun <laughs> literary tchotchkes like <laughs> tote bags or... <laughs> Yeah, we do. It's harder to shop for those right now because we're not letting people in for browsing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've put as many as we can around the doors for people to see um, oh, so that they can just choose them from from far away and we can bring them up to them. Uh, <laughs> but normally we have a, a lot more accessible like tchotchkes and things like that, yeah. I like, that read, I like the Read It Again logo up there. That looks good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, it's painted on our window. I uh, love it. We got somebody in. I'll too. take a t-shirt with that. Yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> and a stained glass window. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I think we can wrap it up. So thank everybody so much for joining thank us. You. And thank you, Maria. Thank you. Next week, thank you. Thank you. Next week we're going to have some poets. Um, so we're going to have Stephen Shields, Liz Garcia, and Michael Dybert. So uh, we'll see everybody then. Uh, thanks again, Maria and Marilyn. Thank you. Thanks for having Take me. Take care, my friends. Love Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>